Welcome to Commander Central episode 88, a special bonus deck tech episode for Patreon supporter Steve and his Varel of the Hulkley deck. I am Dana. I'm Max. And there is no Chris this week on Commander Central because we're having a special bonus episode while we are snowed in. I have not even had a plow up my street yet, so um, I am housebound. And are, are you currently housebound, Max? Uh, the plow came by, but my roommate's car is in the driveway, so I'm, yes, housebound. So, and the reason I asked Max that question and, and just didn't know was because we're also not recording in the uh, basement of love like we usually do. We're actually doing our first. Is this our first, like, episode where we're recording remotely from one another? It is. It's it's weird. Yeah, I'm kind of, I mean, I've done enough shows for the EDA Trackcast remotely, but this is the first time I've done one with you remotely. Yeah. So... Did you do anything interesting this weekend before you got snowed in at, the, at your house, Max? Uh, I finally saw how to say how to save your dragon three. How to train your dragon? There we go. <laughs> how was it? It was really good, really good. I enjoyed it. The first two are actually pretty good. I, don't, I want to say surprisingly so, but they were like they're genuinely good movies and they're good for adults. So I do want to see the third one. Yeah. What about you? I went and saw Captain Marvel with my son, which was really good. Nice. He said it's his favorite Marvel movie. Ooh, that's I, that's a lot of praise. I don't know if it's my, it's not my favorite Marvel movie, but I liked it. It was very good. That that's kind of the general consensus I've been seeing so far on social media is it's good, well, but maybe not the best. Yeah, I, I liked it a lot. Um, we went to the theater, and my wife my wife first of all bought tickets for the three of us on Friday, so we were all set to go on Saturday, and then she got sick, so just the two of just him and I went, and we went in. To the theater, I think we had a four o'clock showing, and when I came out at, you know, it was like quarter after six or something, there's like three inches of snow on the ground, and it's just chaos in the parking lot. So I, I got the vehicle started, and we, we, it took me probably 20 minutes to get home, and it's not that far away. Like, I was driving 10 miles an hour the whole way. That's that's disgusting. And yeah. At least you made it home. I did make it home, and it's, it's like, it's you know, we're recording this on Sunday, so it's March 10th, so I keep going. It's almost spring. We're almost done with all of this ridiculous snow nonsense. Mm-hmm. So I can see the light at the end of the tunnel. We've not played any games since we're recording this on a Sunday, and we usually do our stuff on Tuesday. At least I didn't. Did you play anything in the last couple of days that we missed since our last recording? No, not, so. magi- not magic related. <laughs> but we will tell you if you want to let us know about any games you played, you can find us on social media. You can find us. We are CMDR Central on pretty much everything. That's Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, iTunes, where we appreciate a five-star review. And you can also find us over at flipsidegaming.com. Uh, use our promo code CMDR Central, and you'll get 10% in your, off your orders, $10 or more. Absolutely. And we do have a couple ongoing contests right now as well. Yes, we do have a couple contests going on for the month of March. For Twitter this month, we are giving a we aren't doing a Twitter giveaway. We're doing a Facebook giveaway. That's right. And we're giving away the random assortment of plane cards from Plane Chase. Uh, and you'll be able to see pictures of those over on our Facebook page by searching CMDR Central. Very nice. Any, any like, comment or share will get you entered into the drawing. Very cool. And then for Patreon, if you support us over at patreon.com slash CMDR Central, if you either are a supporter or become one by the end of March... You'll be entered in to win a sealed Yidris precon from, I think, Commander 16. Yeah, yep. Very nice. So we have a couple of those, and that's that's through the end of March, correct? Correct. All right. We did have a little bit of news since we last recorded, which was just the announcement that there's actually officially going to be, was it 32 or 36 Planeswalkers in War of the Spark? 36 Planeswalkers. Man, One per pack. We were just talking on a show just a week or two ago about the possibility of there being a ton of Planeswalkers in War of the Spark. And they've just confirmed that there will be. So we're I'm feeling pretty good about that show we did where we talked about that in advance. Yeah, I am really happy I did not bet any money on your prediction. <laughs> so now we'll have to wait and see if I'm right about them being reverse flip walkers that turn into creatures. Yeah, we'll only have to wait a couple more weeks. I think what previews start in April? I think so, yeah. Man, I'm feeling good about that, though. Like, 36 Planeswalkers is a lot of complexity if they are just, like, traditional Planeswalkers that have three abilities and stay in play for multiple turns. So I, I feel like that guess might wind up being correct. We will have to wait and see. Yeah, that definitely is interesting. I mean, every pack of War of the Spark gets a Planeswalker, so yeah. limited environment is going to be very interesting to see. 
I mean, especially if they're just legit, like, typical planeswalkers that you play and they have three abilities and they're just in the, they're just part of the game then for a few turns. That's, that's adding a lot to, to any environment. But yeah, that's going to be interesting and limited. Yeah. But I'm looking forward to it. I'm, I'm like really excited for the set now. Yeah, me too. Not that I wasn't before because it's kind of the culmination of, you know, multiple years worth of storylines and it's nice to see that kind of wrap up. But the fact that we're getting a really interesting mechanical set, it looks like, is something I'm excited for. Oh, for sure. I guess my only thought is I hope the amount of these points walkers, whether if they're all really good or all really bad, might diminish the the, the estimated value of the set, like for buying a box or something. Oh, sure. Yeah. Conceivably, it could. But I mean, like Dominaria kind of did a similar thing with having a gazillion legends in it. And I guess I'm not really sure what that EV in that box is, but I don't recall anyone really complaining about Dominaria in terms of value either. <laughs> Well, well, Teferi's still legal That's and true. standard, so... <laughs> that soaks a lot of that up. That's absolutely true. Let's ask that question in, like, six months. Right. Good point. <laughs> Although Mox Amber has been spiking in, in anticipation for War of the Sparks. That's carrying some of it, and you've got Karn in there as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, a lot of times it comes down to how many powerful cards are in the set. That, that makes a big difference. Dominaria definitely had a bunch yeah, of them. Yeah, for sure. So let's, let's do a deck tech, Max. Okay, for a patron supporter... Yeah. As you said earlier in the beginning of the show. It's Varel of the Hulkley deck. So you, you have a few questions you usually ask people in advance of this. You want to read the questions and give us the answers back here before we get started? Yeah. So I don't have the questions completely memorized, but we okay. typically ask, what's your meta like? So we can kind of, you know, if it's a casual meta, we don't want to say, okay, go super combo and Eldrazi like Chris would probably recommend. <laughs> right. Go buy a Lion's Eye Diamond. Yes. Or if it is a competitive meta, then we just we have a better way to know how we should grade your deck. Or and we, to, and we, still pro- we still probably wouldn't say go buy a Lion's Eye Diamond just because that's yeah, it's insane. But yeah, it we, is. We, we do tweak based on that for sure. But speaking of Lion's Eye Diamonds, we, I do ask a budget question, like how much overall do you have an idea for the budget? You know, should we be recommending cards like Dublin Season or Lion's Eye Diamond if they can't afford cards like that? Right. Also makes it a little more challenging for us, which is a lot of fun. Yeah, absolutely. Keeps it interesting every time. Yep. And then typically the final thing we ask is what is the overall goal of the deck or where are you struggling with the deck and why you wanted us to go over it for you? Yes. So the basic information we got back was that the meta in this case is casual and it's mostly creature based without any real big combos or or infinite finishes. Uh, He said on a scale from one to 10, he thinks decks are six to eight. And I would guess, at least based on that description, that sounds more on the six end of that spectrum in terms of power. Yeah, I would I would like to agree with that as well. Uh, I said there's no real huge specific limit on cost, but, you know, like a dual land would be out. So I'm guessing, we, so we'll, we'll, we'll skip that part, but anything reasonably priced, he said, should be fine for the deck. And what did we get back for a goal here? Uh, let's see here. Uh, he says uh, he kind of has wandered off from the original goal of the deck when he first built it. Right now, he wins a lot of life, wins a lot of games by just increasing his life total really high and making a lot of mana and just whacking people with walking ballista. Yeah. A lot of individual synergies in the deck, but no overarching like goal or theme that maybe you and I would typically build towards. Sure. And in looking at the deck, I tend to agree there's quite a few different directions going on here overall. The first note he also has here is he said that the deck might just work better with Pier and Toothy, and he's thought about making that change as well. So that's the first thing we need to address. What are your thoughts on that change from Varel to Pier and Toothy? Um, you know, we, we have a Pier and Toothy deck in the shop, and it is very powerful. It kind of explodes out of uh, nowhere uh, when it d- is played. I like Pier and Toothy. I think I like it a little more than Varel just because they're newer and a little more interesting with the partner mechanic. And they also impact Planeswalkers where Varel doesn't. Yeah, they're also a little more resilient just in terms of having Toothy there as a draw spell in the command zone is really, really, really useful. Not that Pier isn't really good, but Pier is very similar to Varel in terms of power level. And if you kind of consider them a wash, and I, I think that's probably a reasonable assessment, if those two are a wash, just having Toothy there as a bonus makes it a better pair, I think. Yeah, 
I would agree with that. I, I do think overall, though, I think Pira is a little better than Varel. I, I, I would ag- probably also agree. The advantages you have with Pier is he just works. You don't need to wait a turn. Like with Varel, it's a tap ability. So you cast right. you cast Varel. You, if, assuming you don't have haste, you have to wait a full turn to use him. And, the, and you still have to pump mana into him to use his ability as well. Pier just does his thing. Like you cast Pier, and he starts putting extra counters on things immediately. Yeah. Varel, though, in my opinion, if you wanted to go more competitive, a little more combo based, Varel is where you want to be in this this type of deck. And I think Varel probably works better if you want to do like a, one big, huge thing a turn. Like if you want a creature that has, you know, 14 counters on it and you want to turn it into 28 counters for like just that single smash to the face killing blow, it probably works better for that. Whereas Pier, I think, is better for doing little incremental advantages throughout the whole course of your turn because it isn't an activated ability. It just happens. It's a triggered ability, so it just happens whenever you do something. So I think there is a little bit of a play style difference between the two of them. But I, I would agree. I think if this was my deck, I myself would probably put Peer and Toothy in the zone. Yep. I, I, I would probably tend to do the same as well. So the deck has a relatively low uh, overhead here, 3.19 average CMC. That seemed pretty solid to me for a casual meta for sure. Oh, yeah, definitely. Especially with uh, when we get into this, there's not a lot of like ramp to get them out of the out of the gate pretty quick in it like you would expect in a typical Simic deck. Yeah, there isn't a ton at all. We'll touch on that in a little bit. We want to look at lands here first. Sure. 38 total lands in a two color deck. That's definitely a safe amount. I'm, I would, I'm not going to say take less out, but you definitely don't need more than that. And at a 3.19, I think you would be fine at 37. Oh, yeah. I think 37 would be perfect in two colors. I even think going down to 36 is fine, especially at 3.19. My Dromoka deck is two colors, and I'm running 36, and that has a, a little bit of a higher average CMC in it. Yeah. I mean, my what I would probably do here to test it out is just try putting in some low CMC card in place of one land, taking you to 37, and run that then for, you know, two months or something and make sure you're comfortable with it. And then you could try even going to 36. Like, it's not the kind of thing. It's super easy to reverse. Like, if you put a land in and take a land out and put a, you know, rampant growth or something in that slot that's also a ramp spell, you know, that's a pretty easy change to see and see how it affects your deck very quickly. You'll either notice it or you, you'll you just realize, I've, I've had this in my deck for two months and I've never once had a problem with lands and the ramp's been nice or you'll you know you'll feel like you do have a problem with lands but i i would guess he doesn't right so that that would be my first suggestion is maybe pull one land out for one low cmc card just to not affect your curve too much and see how that plays and then if it's fine down the road maybe try even one more but you could definitely do one any specific lands that jump out at you that you would pull or add max I would probably pull a basic and just add something like a Homeward Path or even like a Scavenger's Ground in, into this deck. There's not a lot of land destruction, but the casual, the more casual meta, that makes sense. Yeah. But even adding a Homeward Path to make sure you can keep Varel around to do your uh, shenanigans would be probably a smart move. In a creature-based deck where you're relying on combat damage, particularly combat damage from... A creature that's presumably going to be huge like this isn't a, a swarm deck where you've got you're going to have nine or ten creatures going in at once and you can afford to lose one this is a deck where you're probably going to have one or two creatures that are ginormous you really get shut down in that case when someone drops a control magic so yeah i, I tend to agree and this is the type of deck where i myself want a homeward path mm-hmm. uh, one that i think is not necessary is band panorama um, number one it's it fetches three different kinds of lands, so you're, it's kind of overkill here as a as a fetch land. But the land always comes to play tapped anyway. So Bad and Panorama, basically, you are going to get a basic that comes into play tapped, so you're not even color fixing. I mean, you can get whichever color you need the most, I guess. I shouldn't say you're not color fixing, but you don't have the added utility. But that land is always going to be tapped. You could just run Botanical Sanctum. It's relatively cheap right now. And, you know, yes, it comes into play tapped after turn three. But the, well, so the basic off band panorama is coming to play tapped too, and it's always coming to play tapped. So mm-hmm. you, you have a chance to have it not be tapped, but even if it is, it's no worse because it's already tapped off the panorama, and it makes you both colors. 
versus just being a basic land. So I, I think there's absolutely there's no downside to swapping that panorama for a sanctum, and there's pretty decent upside. Yeah, I I would agree with that. I I almost would want to cut the panorama for a ramp spell maybe, instead. Maybe if if I was going to just cut a land to drop down to thirty seven, that would be the one I would cut. Yeah, and I think you could probably afford like this deck he said has some life gain, but even if it didn't. The Panic the Pain lands are great. I don't mind occasionally losing a life to a Pain land because it never comes into play tapped. And particularly in a two-color deck, a surprising amount of times, you can just tap it for the colorless. I mean, you're probably never going to lose more than a couple of life over the course of a game to it. And there is no Yavamaya Coast in this deck. I would be very tempted to just put that in a slot somewhere as well. Again, it provides you both colors. There's just not much downside. And it's not going to be a tempo hit ever. Makes sense to me. The only other one I really have a question on is the Vesuva. I have that note on that as well. I don't know what you're copying with that. Yeah, because it's going to copy any of the lands. Like, he's running Academy Ruins because there's a, quite a lot of artifacts in this deck. But if you copy Academy Ruins, it's still legendary. So and it still blows up, right. still blows up. I mean, uh, if you, occasionally you can maybe copy the, um, the Bounce Lands in the Growth Chamber. And if you manage to pull that off, that's fine. Like, if you have Growth Chamber in play and next turn you drop Vesuva... That's, you know, that feels probably pretty good, but I don't know. I don't, there's nothing else that I feel like copying is really worthwhile. Question, and maybe our listeners will know this, or maybe you know this. If you copy the bounce land, don't you have to bounce it back to your hand or oh, bounce well, something to your hand? You know what? I, I was going to say you don't, cause, but I think that's Despian's fate. Yeah. Despian's fate. I think Vesuva you do because of the way it's worded. So you, yeah, that wouldn't even work with Vesuva. You're right. I was thinking Thespian stage. Yeah, yeah. I I just don't know if Vesuva does enough to. It's a good card in a lot of certain situation kind of decks, and I wonder if maybe once upon a time there was a Dark Depths or something in here. Very possible. Very possible. Maybe a couple defensive lands here as well. Like there's enough basics that this deck could afford to maybe run a land removal land. Maybe you never see anything that you need to deal with, so maybe that's fine too. But there are enough times when that Maze of Ith or Core Haven shuts you down, or someone else has a Nick though. That's you know, making a ton of mana that you need to deal with. I just feel like a simple tech edge or a ghost quarter would solve problems often enough and it's worth having those in one or two slots. Usually I would say strip mine, but that's not a cheap card anymore. But strip mine's obviously the best answer there. And, I, and you know, you just actually said a card that's not in this deck at, at Nykthos. He's not running sure. Nykthos. And there's, well, there is quite a few artifacts, but I don't think there's too many where it becomes a problem, there's, what, 21 artifacts in this deck, but that still leaves, you know, three enchantments and another 25 creatures and two planeswalkers. That's probably enough mm -hmm. to justify Nick those. Right, and a lot of his creatures are one of each color, so you, yeah. you, have, your, you have your choice of what color mana you want to make. And even Nick those again, it taps for a colorless, so like, worst case, there's just not a ton of downside to it. Yep. And it comes in untapped. Right, exactly. So it's not even a tempo hit. Uh, scavenger Grounds, I'm not sure I mentioned that. I always mention Scavenger Grounds because <laughs> I think it should it'd be in every deck because graveyard stuff happens. But I, I like – that's a nice safety blanket. I, I don't even have to like use it that much. I don't – I play Scavenger Grounds and I I use it maybe one out of every five games where I have it in play. So I don't even use it that much. I just feel like there's there's not a lot of downside to it. And when it's when, – when you manage to use it or when you need to use it and you use it, it could just save you a game. Oh, for sure. So that's when I would maybe consider finding a slot for as well. I ran a plus one counters deck for a while. I had a Mimeoplasm deck that was a plus one counters themed deck, and then I converted it into um, Janara, Asura of War, which was a Bant version of the same deck. So I went from Saltai to Bant, and then eventually took it apart. And now I'm actually, I just finished putting together a Jund plus one counters deck, a Crash the Blood Braided, that's going to be a, a fling deck, but it has a plus one counters theme to make the creature's big. And Novagen and Aran Reef, I ran in all of those decks. I don't currently have them in my Crush build because when I ran them in my previous Plus One Counters deck, I personally found that I really struggled on almost any turn to have mana free to use them. And they're both lands that let you tap to put a counter on creatures that came into play that turn. Uh, Aran Reef puts a plus one counter on each green creature that entered the battlefield this turn, and Nova Jin costs two to activate, a green and a blue, and you put a plus one counter on each creature that entered the battlefield this turn as well, not not green creatures. So basically, they let you put extra counters on stuff when it comes into play. I, like, 
very rarely, if ever, was able to have mana free because, first of all, the land itself essentially is a mana. You're not able to tap it for mana. So that's so sucking up one there. In Novagen's case, you have to spend two more. And Aran Reef only works on green creatures. I could just never quite find a chance to use them in my deck. But there's also not a lot of downside to it. Like, okay, if you only use them once every... It's kind of like Scavenger Grounds. If you only use it once every 10 games, well, maybe that's fine. Yeah, I mean, if it's all you need is that one extra plus one plus one counter to maybe win the game, it's worth sweating right. in the deck. Well, and speaking of one extra plus one counter, now one one card that seems way worse than those is Lanawar Reborn, which is a land that comes into play tapped, and you can tap it for green, but it has Graft 1. So when it comes into play, it has a plus one counter on it. Whenever a creature comes in the battlefield, you can move that plus one counter from the land onto the creature. That seems worse than those other two, but I found it was significantly better because it didn't require you to have to do anything. If a creature came into play, you just had the option to put a counter on it. It didn't cost you mana. It didn't tap the land. didn't have to do anything. And that, at least when I was playing the deck, was way, way more useful than having to leave the land untapped and then use it to put counters on a creature. Yeah. And yeah. It, it, it also then gets you, because the way Varel works, Varel only does anything to a creature if it already has a counter on it. So that's really nice too. It like if you're playing a creature that doesn't by default have anything on it, it lets you get that first counter on it to start rolling it up. So that is one I like quite a bit. I'm a fan of that card. Yeah. Same here. Let's take a look at artifacts here, because there's a lot of there's a surprising amount of artifacts in this deck. Yeah, 21 artifacts and out of all of them, I wasn't expecting to see maybe 18 of these. Well, so I saw 21 artifacts, and before I even read the list, I was like, okay, so he's just running, you know, eight pieces of ramp or something. Art right. Artifact ramp. But there is not. There's not a ton of ramp. There are only three pieces of ramp here among the artifacts. There is Everflung Chalice, and there's Dark Steel Ingot, and there is Soul Ring. So there's only three, which is kind of surprising. One of the questions, Expedition Map, what land... Do you think that's worth going to get based on that list, Max? Is there one that you think is worth grabbing with X Map? I, I looking at the current list, and this will be up in the show notes. No, I don't think there is a current land I would always go get with Expedition Map. Looking at this list, you know, typically when I think of Expedition Map, I think of Guy's Cradle, Cabal Coffers, Urborg, Tube of Yawgmoth. There's really nothing here that screams get X. Get me with Expedition Map. I kind of agree. I feel like I only want to run it in a deck where I have some land I'm going to go get that's going to change the face of the game. And that might just be me. Maybe it is it is worth running in this deck. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I feel like that's one, in at least based on the current land count as we see it, I feel like X Map just maybe isn't impactful enough given the lands it would go get. So... That's one I was kind of curious about. Um, Darksteel Ingot as well. One of the things I like about Everflung Chalice in this deck is if you cast Everflung Chalice for four, it has two counters on it. Well, then you tap Varel, and now it has four counters on it. And it also doesn't, doesn't utilize the Chalice to do so, so now Chalice can just tap for four mana. That's a pretty good investment uh, of Varel's ability there. Um, so I like that. I would say one of the first swaps I would then make is I would change Darksteel Ingot into Astral Cornucopia, which is essentially a three-mana version of Everflung Chalice. It's XXX to cast, and it comes into play with X charge counters on it, and you can choose a color and add one mana of that color for each charge counter on Astral Cornucopia. So basically, the, the minimum you can cast it for is three mana, and it has one counter on it, and you can tap it for one mana of any color. I mean, the worst case scenario was it's basically a dark steel ingot. I guess it, dark steel ingot's indestructible, so it will survive a Venoblast or something like that that destroys artifacts. But I feel like the amount of times that happens is pretty low. Yeah, I, I would definitely. Those are not objects of my targets when I look at a removal right. spell. So I mean, and maybe. Cornucopia would be like if you cast Cornucopia for six and it's got two counters on it, well, then maybe I'm eyeballing it. And I'm definitely looking at it if you then, you know, Varel it up to four. So now you're tapping it for four or, you know, or up to eight or whatever. But I just feel like having the option there to use that for a Varel target if there's nothing else available is worth it over the Indestructible with Dark Stealing It. Mm -hmm. 
And I think if you switch to Pier and Toothy then at that point, where that's your commander, and it's getting the extra counter on it without even having to activate it, if you just cast it for three, it's now a two-mana rock if you've got Pier in play. I think that it's, it's even better in that kind of deck. Yeah, I, I definitely would agree with that. If you were to switch this to Pier and Toothy, I would slot in Astral Cornucopia in a heartbeat. And I think at that point, too, if you go to Pier, I think things like Coalition Relic or Jeweled Amulet become even better. Any of the, basically, any of the artifacts that give you mana based on counters become that much better with with Pier as your commander, whereas I don't know if you want to blow... I'm sure you definitely don't. You'd want to blow a Varel activation on a Coalition Relic to get you know an extra mana. It's just that you're... you're effectively losing man at that point but with peer where, where it costs you nothing i would definitely look at those two yeah for sure so what other kind of oddball artifacts here jump out at you that you're not quite sure if they're getting the job done max so i i originally was going to say dark steel reactor this is a four drop artifact that's indestructible and it's an alt win condition at the beginning of your upkeep you put a charge counter on it yep. and then when it has 20 more counters on it you win the game i get it for between Varel, the doubling season, and and Pier, and a couple proliferate effects in this deck, this probably wins games quite a bit in my mind. Yeah, I like it too. This is a good deck for that card. At the same time, the one that's really throwing me off is Orochi Hatchery. So this is another XX artifact. It enters with X charge counters on it, but then you can spend five and tap it to create a one one green snake token for every counter that's on the hatchery. So if you cast it for, for two mana, if you put two mana into it, it comes into play with one counter on it. Mm-hmm. You can spend five then to make a snake. That's not a particularly good exchange. No. So let's say you cast it for four, so come in the play with two counters on it, and then you can tap it for five to make two snakes. That's still not ideal, but with Varel, I would assume the thought process is you can then tap Varel, to turn those two counters into four, and then when you spend five, you get four snakes, which is pretty decent. Yeah. But I don't know if it's decent enough. Yeah, so like if, if you're using Varel, I get why Hatchery is decent. But even then, if you cast it for four and it has two counters, you double it to four, man, that's still five mana to then make four snakes a turn is not bad, but it's not amazing. Right, and what really puzzles me about this card in this deck is there's no, there's a little bit of stuff in here that makes tokens, but there's no way to win with them, in my opinion. There's no overrun, overwhelming stampede, or even like a crater hoof to help spread that damage out quickly. So you're just making bodies to chump block, essentially. It feels a little bit like like I've made decks before that had kind of a sub-theme or something, and then over the course of six months, the deck has shifted and changed enough that that sub-theme is no longer a thing. But then I still find myself with like that one card or two cards that you've kind of forgotten were in the deck or not forgotten, but like you've forgot, you've removed all the pieces that made them good. Mm-hmm. And I wonder if that's one of those cards. There's another one under enchantments that we'll talk about in a little bit. It's kind of the same way. I think there was a bit of a um, token sub theme here. And I get that completely with something like doubling season, because again, if you're tapping this for four snakes with the two counters on it, you're doubling season it, you know, you're, you're making twice as many counters. And I guess maybe that's a thought process. In a perfect world, if you cast this for for four mana or X is two, and then you can, you know, it's coming into play with four counters because of doubling season. And if you tap Varel, those four become eight. So at that point, you're spending five mana to make eight snakes. In a perfect world, I guess that's pretty good. But man, that's a lot of pieces that have to come together to spend five mana to make eight snakes. Yeah, that's that's a lot of mana, especially with the very little ramp in this deck. It'd be different if there were, you know, a Signet or maybe a couple of other fast mana rocks or even just like a rampant growth or a Sky Shroud claim well, for es- those early game bursts. And especially if the snakes have no way to win you the game. You, okay, you have eight snakes, and I guess, again, maybe some will have no blockers or something, and you can, you know, smash through with all eight of them. But that just still feels like it's not that great unless you have Skull Clamp out and you're going to be able to spend another you know, four mana to draw eight cards or something. I guess that's good, but that's just a lot of like, if this is in play and this is in play and this is in play and this happens, it's pretty decent. And I feel like if you've met that many variables, if you've met four or five different if conditions, it shouldn't just be pretty good. It should be amazing. And it should be game winner. It should be game winning. Absolutely. Like if you're, if you're, if you're hitting that many if conditions, that should be winning you the game. Cause that's just, 
too difficult to assemble to have it just be okay. Right. So I, I guess now would be a chance to kind of make this comment about the whole deck overall. And, and he even addresses saying he kind of didn't really have a, a theme or anything, but that would be one of the things I would focus on here is just picking one path and kind of going as all in on that path as you can. Oh, for sure. That That's a great way to at least start. Yes. You know, building a deck for a casual meta is we're just going to do a bunch of stuff with plus one, plus one counters or counters in general. Yep. And then go from there. Yes. And yes, you, you know, hatchery does do things with plus one counters, but the thing it does, I just don't know if it helps you enough to to justify a slot. I just don't know if it does. Right. Same. I agree with that. Uh, Transmogrifying Wand is a card I like a lot in some decks, but I, is this a deck for it, do you think? So the, for those who don't remember this, because this was in M, I think M... 19. Is it 19? So it was just the last summer. Um, it comes into play, it's three mana for an artifact, comes into play with three counters on it, and you can spend one and tap it to remove a charge counter and destroy target creature, and its controller gets a 2-4 white ox token in place of that creature. And you can only do this as a sorcery. So it basically winds up being a removal spell where you spend a mana to turn their whatever into a 2-4 ox. Well, I don't know. I don't like that it's sorcery speed. I don't like that it's sorcery speed. And, you know, yes, you can essentially, there's times when doubling season will be out or something else, and this is going to have infinite counters on it or, or enough counters as to be irrelevant. But even then, you can only use one per turn. It's only a destroy effect, so there's going to be times when, you know, there's something you need to deal with and you can't because it's indestructible or something. Um, I think it's a cool card, and I think that this isn't the deck for it, maybe. Yeah, I would I would agree with that. I think it's definitely something, a, just a better removal spell, whether it's a counter spell or another type of removal. I mean, a, pon- in- a Ponjify or Rapid Hybridization for one mana that is going to solve you that problem at instant speed in an emergency and... I just feel like I would rather have that. I'd rather have it one time for one mana at instant speed solving a problem than I would having this in a perfect world. This is going to maybe, you know, hit three creatures in three turns. I still think I'd rather have the emergency problem solver than I would this there every turn. Yeah, I, I'll agree with that. Uh, Divining Top is always useful in a deck. I, I don't love it or run it much anymore, but it's always useful. Lightning Greaves is always useful. Uh, Lux Cannon. For those that don't know Lux Cannon, because it's a relatively old card that has not had a reprint in a while, it's four mana. It's an artifact, and you put a charge counter on Lux Cannon when you tap it, or you can tap it to remove three charge counters from Lux Cannon to destroy target permanent. What do you think of Lux Cannon? It's, again, in a perfect world, you can Varel the counters up, you can doubling season the counters up, you can peer the counters up. Uh, but again, just like the transmognifying wand, it's a... It's a targeted destroy effect, meaning if it has hexproof or is indestructible, there you can't really do much about it. And granted, you can use this at instant speed. I still just think it doesn't cut it. I'd rather run even something like well, uh, Imprison in the Moon, maybe? Sure. Yeah, because that's also going to be slow. It's going to be sorcery speed. And you just the, the creature is just not a problem anymore. Song, right. of the, Song of the Triads or Lignify even. Yeah. All which are runnable in these color combinations, or again, Ponja Fire Rapid Hybridization kind of cards. Yep. And it, not that this deck really needs it, but it, those type of cards will lower the curve a little. Sure. Yeah. And it's already a lean curve, but like there's always, there's way worse things you can do than just incidentally lowering your curve. Yeah. I like Contagion Engine. It's a gazillion mana, six mana to cast and four to activate, but you do get two proliferate triggers and that can hit multiple things. And it also puts a minus one counter on each creature target player controls. So even though it is a gazillion mana, there's going to be times when you wipe out a field of tokens and add a ton of counters to your stuff too. I think right. I think the upside on Contagion Engine is probably worth how much mana it costs. Yep, especially in this type of deck where yeah. uh, being able to double proliferate all your stuff with maybe like a doubling season out is just uh, makes me really happy. Yeah, I agree. Basilisk Collar. Uh, this goes straight into the Walking Ballista combo. <laughs> it just makes it easier to infinite out with, well, at least wipe the board with Walking Ballista. Right. So then the question becomes, because there's no real easy way to tutor that up, 
Is it worth having a card that maybe doesn't do a whole heck of a lot unless you happen to have another creature in play? And it's another creature in play that people immediately know is a bomb and will do everything they can to remove. So is it worth a slot for that artifact, as, as useful as it is, that probably isn't going to accomplish a whole ton unless you have one more creature in play? Knowing that this is a casual meta, yes. I, I think I would be, I would run this card just because it might happen. The one other thing I will note, I, I say that it's not good in other creatures, but that's not necessarily true. Because of the way Death Touch works with Trample, if this winds up on your Mana Gorge or Hydra, which is an 1818, and you swing in and someone blocks with their own big creature, you still only need to put one point of damage into that creature before you trample the rest over because it's it's enough to be lethal. So maybe that happens enough too, where like you're gonna put that on some other big creature that you've that you've buffed up with counters and just use it for a as a way to carry more damage over when you swing. Mm-hmm. I still don't know if I personally would run it, but I do think there's maybe enough utility here for it. Yeah, I think there just needs to be a better way to go get it. So whether that's like a fabricate or uh Oh sure. You know, a transmute spell that can go grab that one drop. Like muddle the mixture. Yeah, right. Yeah, muddle goes and gets it and it goes and gets a bunch of other things that are useful as well. Things like cyclonic rift and off the top of head, kind of thing. Yeah, so yeah, right. Yeah. I think it has to be I think it has to be exactly the CMC. So I think it has to be something that costs two. But, you know, there's enough things in here in this deck that, you know, whether it's Illusionist Bracers or there's a couple of creatures at that at that slot, I think. Okay, so we'd want more like something like Dizzy Spell or, yeah, but yeah. you get what I'm saying. Yeah. Anything else with artifacts you want to touch on here, Max? Um, No, I think we covered it. I think adding maybe another piece of ramp like the Signet or even like the Locket, if you can't get your hands on a Signet, would be smart. The Locket at least gets you some card draw involved as well. I think generally speaking... Particularly because Varel, when he's in play, is going to suck up two mana every single turn. I would like a little more ramp in this deck because you're, you're, you're kind of going to be down two mana every turn if you're playing on utilizing Varel. So I, I think this is a deck where you want a little bit extra in there. And I would, a few of those cards that maybe aren't quite as good, like Thousand Year Elixir, for example, it does let you use Varel right away. I guess maybe that's not a good example. But talking about like Lux Cannon, if we weren't sure if that was good enough, or Hatchery, I'd be very tempted to replace a few of those with things like Simic Signet or the Locket, like you mentioned, right. ways to just make it easier to do your thing you want to do that turn and do Varel. Yeah. I, th- I think the best card out of all the artifacts, and we really didn't talk about this to cut, would be Eternity Vessel. For those who don't know, it's a six mana artifact. When it enters the battlefield, it has X charge counters on it where X is your life total. And it has a landfall trigger, so whenever a land enters the battlefield under your control, you may have your life total become the number of counters on Eternity Vessel. Yeah, the upside on that, now that's one, like, talking about the perfect world thing with Hatchery, where, okay, if everything breaks correctly, you can spend five mana to make eight snake tokens. Mm -hmm. That's, I don't know if it's worth that. Now here, in a perfect world, Eternity Vessel comes into play you know, at 31 or 32 or something, because you lost a little bit of life, but you have doubling season out and it turns into 64. Yeah. And then you activate Varel and it turns into, well, not even 128 because you're getting the Varel and then doubling season trigger on top of it. So, Ugh. so in a perfect world, Eternity Vessel is, is, a, has a disgusting upside versus the Orochi Hatchery where I'm not sure if the, if the, even the perfect situation makes it that amazing. Right. Whereas the perfect situation with, with uh, turning the vessel makes it really, really difficult to kick you out of the game. Yeah, I guess that's true. Enchantments. Only I, three. I think double one season probably should stay in the deck. I, I would <laughs> agree with so? that yeah, as well, Dana. Is, is, that, is that good enough plus one counter deck? That, it, it, I mean, yeah, I've had luck with it. I don't know about you. I think it's probably pretty decent. Inexorable Tide. Whenever you cast a spell, proliferate. Ooh. In this deck, it makes sense, but... In my luck with it, it always draws a removal spell pretty dang quick. It does eat removal spells because it doesn't do anything when you cast. You spend five mana and it sits there. You need to actually cast a second spell and have something in play. But I think it's probably worth it. I, I like it here. Yeah. So the so the here's another one of the um, questions, and this is also a a card that I feel like is maybe that I mentioned before is was part of a previous build of the deck is Wolf Caller's Howl, is the third enchantment. 
and it's three and a green. At the beginning of your upkeep, create X two two green wolf creature tokens where X is the number of your opponents with four or more cards in hand. So I've ran this before in a token deck, and occasionally it's good, but most of the time it's only okay. So what are your thoughts on Wolf Caller's Howl? This is really glass cannon. It's requiring you to make sure it only works at your upkeep, and it, you need to have opponents with cards in hand. So if you're playing against that aggro Boros player that uh, you know by turn five has one card in hand and is in top deck mode for the rest of the game, well, now you're relying on two other opponents to maybe always have four cards in hand. I mean, I I don't like cards that I'm going to situationally, that I'm going to draw regularly that don't do anything. Like, there's, you know, you're absolutely going to draw Swords to Plowshares at times when no one has a creature in play. That doesn't mean it's a bad card. Swords to Plowshares are still amazing. But there's going to be enough times when you draw Wolf Caller's Hole and look around and it's a dead card. Mm-hmm. Whether it's because no one has cards in hand or it's because it's turn... 14 and two people are out of the game and it's down to 1v1. So even if they do have enough cards in hand, you're spending four mana to make a 2-2 every turn. So, I mean, I guess you could cast it, but it's not entirely dead, but that feels pretty weak. Yeah. I just don't know. And and there's really not a ton of synergy aside from doubling season. Yeah, I I mean, I'll agree with that. And I guess you could say the reverse, too, as his opponent. I may situ- situationally play around this and just play down to three cards every turn. Yeah, I guess. Or make sure I only have three cards in my hand at his turn. So draw a bunch on my turn, and maybe if I'm running like a Talarin deck, just make sure I'm down to three cards before his upkeep. I think the biggest dig against Wolf Caller's Howl is you could be running card and scales. Oh, yeah, that'd be way better in this deck. I mean, it, it's going to consistently do things for you more often. It, you know, Like we said, it lowers your curve, and you can always do way worse things than that. It is 10 or $11 right now, so it's not nothing. That's a lot of money for some people, and I get that. But I just feel like in the overall gameplay here, I think that's going to way more consistently help you out than this Wolf Caller's Hollow will. Any other big enchantments you'd like to see here, Max? Um, I think uh, if you want to go with more of the doubling of your counters, you could try Primal Vigor. It's a pseudo doubling season for six mana. That hits everybody. But it, it does help all everybody, but I mean, you might be the only person that can truly take advantage of it at the table. Yep. So, I mean, it is $20 because it's only been printed once. Yeah. But I think it might be the worst of them all, knowing that now that Peer exists. Right. I, 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 yeah, it, it's, a, it's a neat enough card, but I've seen people get burned by it before. So maybe, I guess it depends on the meta. Like if you're in a meta where people don't play a ton of other token decks or have other counter stuff and it's just not going to help them very much, then it, mm-hmm. it gets way better. Yeah. I have one more. Okay. And that is Hadana's Climb. That's, I, I, I have two more and that's one of my two. Okay, so Hadana's Climb is the flip enchantment from Ixalan. At the beginning of combat on your your turn, put a plus one, plus one counter on target creature you control. Then if that creature has three or more plus one, plus one counters on it, you can flip it into the Winged Temple of Ar- Ar- Arazka. So it's a legendary land that can tap for any color. And then for three mana again, target creature you control gets plus X, plus X, and gains flying where X is its power until end of turn. So in this deck, very often you're going to spend three mana for Hadana's Climb and you're going to move to combat and it's just going to flip. Like you're not going to have to have done anything. The condition will have already been met and you're just going to put a counter on a thing as a bonus and then it's just going to flip over into Wing Temple just for no reason at all other than you're doing the thing you're already doing. And then at that point, you have the option to then spend three mana to... Give one of your give your biggest creature presumably evasion, and double its power to end of turn. Right. That's there's enough situations, a, a lot of them, frankly, where you're just going to kill somebody when you play this card. Oh, for sure. We're, and let's not even talk about maybe untapping it with Kiora's follower. Yes, and then doing it to a second creature. Oh, disgusting. That would be Ooh. one I would for sure find room for. And it's yes. it's it's I want to say it's around two or three dollars right now. It's still relatively inexpensive. Yes. The other one I would recommend here, um, and I would, like, 
these aren't just – in the case of these two cards or, or the three cards with hardened scales, I would for sure say run all three of these hardened scales, Hadamus Climb, and the last one would be Simic Ascendancy, which was the new card out of Allegiance, and it's just two mana for an enchantment, one blue, one green. And you can spend one, a green and a blue, to put a plus one counter on target creature you control, which isn't great, but it's also not a tap ability. If you happen to have a ton of mana free for whatever reason, you could just sink, you know, six mana or nine mana or 12 mana into, into this and just put four counters on something. And again, if you happen to have doubling season out or hardened scales, you're getting an extra bonus on that or you happen to have peer out or whatever. But the nice part about this is whenever one or more plus one counters are put onto a creature you control, you put that many growth counters on Simic Ascendancy, and at the beginning of your upkeep, if it has 20 or more growth counters on it, you win the game. Again, this is a card where you're going to cast this sometimes past the turn, and if somebody doesn't respond to it, you're just going to win next turn because you have enough counters on things already just from doing what you were already doing. Like You're going to be playing the game, putting counters on stuff with Varel or or Pier and Toothy as it go, however, however you go, you'll top deck this and you'll go, oh, well, I'm going to play it and can anyone, can anyone remove it? Because I'm going to win next turn due to things you've already done. Yeah, that is 100% true about Simic Ascendancy. It is a great card and I actually haven't seen it at the shop yet. So, but this would be the deck I'd want it in. The, the Pier and Toothy deck we have, I know he has it in the deck, but I've never seen him cast it so far with it in the deck, but it's there. And also we should note, this deck is running Vidalcan Ori to give you flash on things, and it is running Alchemist Refuge to also give you st- give your stuff flash or let you flash in a spell. Mm-hmm. So this is also something where like you don't even have to survive a full turn. You can just wait until it comes back around and the person before you, you know, does a pass, okay, I'm passing the turn, and you can say, wait, before the end of your turn, I'm going to, you know, either from Alchemist Refuge or because of... Or re- flash in some ascendancy and hey, look at all the counters on my stuff. Okay, my turn, I win. Right. So that Ooh. that's one I would definitely probably try to find room for in this deck. Also. Yeah. Instant speed spells. Ooh. So there's a few enchantments, or excuse me, a few um, counter spells in here, and the rest tend to be removal. There's eight yes. total spells. Uh, we'll talk about the counter spells first. There's original counter spell. There's Disallow, there's Plasma Capture, and technically, I guess, Simic Ascendancy lets you... Uh, oh, it isn't. Simic Charm, excuse me. And actually, I said that it isn't even a counterspell. That's just a, a bounce. So there's really only the um, three counterspells. I don't like Plasma Capture. This is... I don't not like Plasma Capture. <laughs> plasma Capture, for those that don't know, is basically a mana drain that costs an additional two green. So mm-hmm. you counter target spell... And at the beginning of your next pre-combat main phase, you add X mana in any combination of colors to your mana pool, where X is that spell's converted mana cost. I like it well enough. I think in a casual meta, you're gonna, you know, add enough. You're gonna eat enough big six or seven drop creatures often enough, and it's gonna give you a huge turn next time. I don't dislike. I, if I was pulling one of the three counter spells, I'd pull disallow first. Okay, I, I can see that. What are your thoughts I guess... on disallow? It's fine. I think there are better things for one in blue, blue than Disallow, but the Stifle is nice. I, it does give you all of, uh, the option, like you said, to, to, to Stifle something or, or hit an ability you couldn't otherwise hit. You know, you can counter a Planeswalker activation if you want to. But what I found with Disallow was I didn't ever do that. Like, I ran it right. in a deck, and I, w- I was super pumped for this card when it came out. And I still found that 99% of the time I was using it as a counter spell, in which case it's a cancel. Mm-hmm. Like at some point, a modular spell ceases to be modular if you never use any of the other modes. Right. So, I guess I would just prefer if I want to go with a modular counter spell, one that I actually am going to use modes on. So whether that's Cryptic Command or a Mystic Confluence, those would be I, my I would agree first with that. two. I guess if I'm going to pay double blue for something, I want it to do a lot more than stifle something. I, I I think you want to go one of two ways. You want it to either do something bomby, whether it's Mystic Confluence, or I think Plasma Capture fit, fits that criteria where it's going to do something that's going to shake up the game. Hey, I'm going to hit. I'm, I'm hitting your Elish Norn, and I'm going to put seven man on my pool next turn. I think that sh- that radically changes the face of the game. They've had a huge tempo hit, 
and lost something that they were maybe counting on to do a mini board wipe, and you have not only stopped that from happening, but you're gaining seven mana next turn. I think it can radically shift things. So I think Plasm Capture is enough of a big bomby spell that it's maybe worth four mana. I think the other thing you'd want to do if you're not running something like that, that changes the game at four or five is you want to run something as lean as possible. I think counter spell probably qualifies at only two, but I think three for disallow is probably too much. And I would much rather see maybe a swan song or something that's going to deal with most problems at one mana. Yeah. Yep. I could, I, I'd get behind so, that. So how about the removal? Cause these are removal spells here. So we have beast within cross and grip and reality shift. All of which are probably spells I would run in this deck. Yep, same here. I, I think, mean, we I'm, mentioned them earlier. I would probably try to find a slot for Imprisoned in the Moon, Song of the Dryads, and uh, at least those two. Maybe the new one from Dominaria that freezes something What's really nice the about those ones, too, is they take care of commanders long term. Like, there are enough situations where if somebody, com- somebody pl- pays their scary commander and, you know, okay, if you destroy it, they'll recast it next turn. There's decks that can't deal with you Song of the Rising, their commander. Like, they have no way to remove that enchantment. Or if they do, they have, okay, so I have one or two spells in my entire deck that get it back. That's effectively removing that commander. You're exiled it almost from the game. It's almost like tucking it. For sure. Like, I don't don't think you want to run, like, six of those effects, but I think I like to have one or two in a lot of my decks. And I I think you're in the right colors for it between... Imprison the Moon and Deep Freeze and Lignify and Song of the Dryads, you can afford to run one or two of those removal spells because they basically wind up being, you know, essentially sorcery speed removal, but you don't want too much of that, but you can afford to have one or two pieces of it if it does something as effective as removing the commander from play for multiple turns. Yep. The one instant I'm not a fan of, I guess, in this deck is Simic Charm. So it has three modes. Target creature gets plus three, plus three until end of turn, so it's a beast... What did I forget what that card is? Excuse me, it's a giant growth. Yep. Or permanents you control gain hexproof until end of turn or return target creature to its owner's hand. So you can either protect your stuff or giant growth something or bounce a creature. The middle mode is really good. I think giving your stuff hexproof is probably useful pretty often. I don't know how often this deck cares about giant growthing something unless it's there's there is a few things that do infect here, and maybe that's enough to push it over the top but I don't know if those other two modes are worth are worth it. I don't know. I don't think they are. Right. Yeah. I'm, I feel like I'd rather just run heroic intervention. Uh, yeah. I don't, I don't see a big enough target in this deck as the list stands currently to use that plus three plus three. Cause it doesn't even give it trample. So well, it, I would, I would rather just spend one and a green to make all my stuff indestructible and hex proof. I tend to agree with that. There's also, uh, yeah, if you want to protect your stuff, Inspiring Call is really good. It gives your stuff indestructible, which isn't always the same as Hexproof, but Hexproof doesn't help you against a board wipe, and Inspiring Call does. But it can also draw you a fistful of cards in this deck, because it draws you a card for each creature you control with a plus one counter on it. Yes, it does. So that's one I would like in this deck. I would probably run that over Simic Charm as well, that or Heroic Intervention. And I do think, as an instant speed spell here, Solidarity Heroes was a card that just won me games in plus one counter decks. It is one in a green, and you choose any number of target creatures and double the amount of plus one counters on them, and you can hit additional creatures for each one in a green you spend because it has Strive. So for two mana, you double the counters on a creature. You can spend four and do it again. There were so many times at instant speed I would swing at somebody with a big buff creature with you know eight counters on it and the person's like okay they're doing the math they're like i can afford to take that eight damage off this creature and boom you turn it into 16 and 32 and kill them for four mana right Uh, it's just a really good card and it's a way to just kill people very very efficiently in terms of how much mana you spend so i I guess actually you can't hit the same creature twice i'm thinking but like if you're swinging with multiple things you can buff multiple things up simultaneously and just clock somebody who thought they weren't going to get clocked. Exactly. So that's a card I like. That's a card I like as an instant here as well. And another instant that could be really good in this deck would be Growth Spiral. It's a it's a green and a blue from Ravnica Allegiance. You draw a card, and then you may put a land from your hand, 
onto the battlefield, and that's any land, first of all, not just basic. Uh, so you can put your shock in or any of those utility lands you may or may not add. It's instant speed, and you get to draw a card, and that is definitely something this deck is lacking is card draw and ramp. So let's look at Planeswalkers here real quick. There's a couple of them in this deck. There's a Kiora, Master of Depths, and Tezzeret the Seeker. Hmm, this is this is interesting. The Tezzeret, typically I would say, well, why is that in this deck? But he is running 21 artifacts. Yes. So that makes a lot of sense. And you can, you know, doubling season fun. If you have a bunch of artifacts out, you drop him, you can make them all 5-5s. Five Things like Lux Cannon lets you reuse if you keep that in the deck. lets you reuse that hatchery, although it does still cost you five mana. I like Tezzeret. There's not necessarily anything bad about him. He does give you that tutor we talked about before to find some of these artifacts if you need them to do a thing. I still don't know if he's that amazing, maybe, but... Yeah, I think I would rather, you know, if this was my idea of a deck, I would probably get rid of some of the artifacts we've talked about today uh, and replace for some other stuff that's more my play style. And I'd put, like, one of the Garooks in this deck that maybe gave all your stuff a uh, trample or, like, an overrun effect. Yeah, and, and I kind of agree. Like, I think these are both great great cards, and if you have a doubling season out, they're that much better when they come into play. But I also feel like this is where I would maybe make cuts as well when I was if I was really heavily leading into plus one counters, which is probably what I personally would do. This might be where I would do that, was with these two cards. Not that they're both not fine, but I that's the direction I would probably personally go. Fair enough. How about the creatures? 25 different creatures, and I, I actually remember this specifically when I ran both my plus one counter decks because they were both so creature-centric based on that was my win condition, was hitting with some big creature. I was at 25 in both versions of that deck, and I think my Kresh fling deck right now is at 24. So that seems like roughly what I would be running in this deck. Yep, I, I would definitely agree. I mean, blue and green have some of the better plus one, plus one counter cards in this in the game, I guess, in those colors. But yeah, this is definitely a uh, creature-centric strategy, so you want as many as you can with something to do with plus one, plus one counters. And even the things that don't, like Tatiova, I mean, she's never going to be bad. She's a draw spell when you play land. That's pretty decent. Padim, Console of Innovation, protects your artifacts and lets you draw a card if you control an artifact with the highest CMC. That would probably, again, if this was me, I would probably peel a few of those artifacts out like we talked about, in which case then Padim becomes not a piece that's that useful. And one thing I would maybe consider there if I did all of that is I think Gyre Sage is a good creature in that slot. Gyre Sage is a mana dork for one and a green out of the original Return to Ravnica block. The, the, the first Return to Ravnica block, which I guess is not the original Ravnica block, that's the second Ravnica block. It has evolve, and you put a plus one, which which means you put a plus one counter on it whenever a creature enters battlefield under your control that has a greater power or toughness, and it's a one two. And you can right. tap it for a green for each counter on it. That seems like it would be useful in this kind of deck, but I speaking from experience, there was a ton of times in my plus one counter deck where that Gyre Sage just effortlessly had like six or eight or ten counters on it because I would you know, just accidentally put a couple on them from casting big creature spells and then using Varel or Gilder Bairn or something, double those counters up, and all of a sudden that Geyer Sage is tapping for a dozen mana in a turn. And I, so I, I think that's one I like a lot, and if I went to pull that Padim, which I would probably wind up doing, that's one of the creatures I would add to this deck. Yeah, I I like that idea. I have one to add to this deck, but I feel bad asking them to add it because it's is it, is really expensive. Is it Sanguine Bond and... and no, and wrong colors, Okay, thank you. <laughs> no, my recommendation is Hydroid Crisis. Yeah, it's a, that, I mean, it would be fantastic in this deck and it's probably going to, you know, it'll be also be a, a $2 card in when it rotates, when it, when it rotates out, but right now it's not a $2 card. So, no, I agree with that one. But... That definitely would be great in this deck. You know, the cast it's a cast trigger, so you do it to gain your life and draw your cards. And if it resolves, you have a big flying trample yep. crisis that's going to hit people. I like Altered Ego, which is a clone, essentially, that comes into play with counters on it. That's really good here as well. I mean, a, this is just all the stuff I ran in my plus one counter stack, whether it's Champion from Lambhold, Champion of Lambhold or Deep Goal Skate or Manigord or Hydra or... 
Pierre and Toothy are both in here, and Seaborn Muse is never a bad card in a green deck. Spike Weaver is a great card in general, and the fact that in this deck you're going to pretty often just be able to infinite fog because you're never going to run out of counters on it is sick. Right. Viral Drake letting you proliferate is great. Walking Ballista enough times just wins you the game in this kind of deck. Mm-hmm. So the creature one probably cl- most closely resembles what I would probably be running here. Yep, and I, I feel that's probably the, the same for a lot of rail decks. Yeah. Uh, the the one I'm surprised is not in here is Prime Speaker Zagana, because... You're just going to draw all the cards with Prime Speaker Zagana sometimes. Right, and probably win the game. <laughs> uh, although I will say this, it's not a May effect, and I did, I have decked myself in the past with my... In my plus one counters deck because of Prime Speaker. So that can happen if you've got some giant creature in play in a doubling season and you're not paying attention. You can just go, oh, okay, I'm going to play this. It's a draw 32. Oh, wait, no, it's a draw 64. Oh, nope, I don't have 64 cards. I'm just dead. Right. So that can happen, but that's not a reason not to run Prime Speaker. <laughs> I think you still, you know, I would still strongly consider it. And the new Prime Speaker isn't bad either because you let your, your stuff with counters gain trample, and that's not nothing. Sometimes that you need that to carry the damage over. So that's one I would consider. I think generally speaking, so we, we've thrown a few suggestions out there. I, I think it needs a little more ramp, whether that's artifact ramp or, you know, the nature's low ramp and growth type, go getting a land. I think it needs more draw too. Yes, I, I think ramp and draw are my biggest Achilles heel yeah. with this deck right now is those two things that I look for when I build when I build my decks just are kind of lackluster right now. I, I think if you have peer, peer in the peer and toothy in the command zone, that mitigates a little bit of that because toothy draws a good amount of cards. But I think there are enough things here that you mentioned. You know, Crassus has draw baked into it. That's a really useful one to have in this deck too. That's the kind of thing that kind of saw does a two for one. The I, I just forgot the name of it, Max. We mentioned at the instant speed that makes your creatures indestructible and draws you a card for plus one counters. Inspiring, inspiring call. call. I mean, that is doing a thing you want to do already anyway, and it's going to get you some draw. You've got things like Tezzeret's Gambit that draws you cards and is going to let you proliferate on top of that as well. So there's there's enough little draw effects in these color combinations that you could run in this deck that would get you the draw you need, and it's going to help with your plus one counters theme. Right. Um, so yeah, th- this deck, uh, uh, this feels almost like that uh, the first draft you did, and you've gone and you've, and you've gone to play it, and now you need to do that second pass and be like, okay, Wolf Caller's Howl, super cool card. It just doesn't do enough in this deck. Disallow is a yeah. great looking card, but I found that I just it was a cancel for me ninety nine percent of the time. So I might as well run something that's a cheaper cancel. So yeah, I, I like the deck. I like. I like seeing Varel too, number one, because he's an older card at this point. That's six years old, and I just don't think I've seen many Varel decks. Yeah, I, I would agree. I think he has been, he's just overshadowed by some of the better plus one, plus one counter well, put it in, stuff in Simic. Particularly now that Pier and Toothy exist. Yes. So, I and, and I would be very tempted. I, I also, I think the partner as a mechanic, the partners with mechanic is a lot of fun. So, uh, it, I also think that I would consider that change just because having two creatures in the command zone is pretty neat sometimes. Oh, yeah. That, uh, it adds an interesting dynamic to the game and how you play out your deck. Yes. I think that's what I've got, Max. That, I, I think that wraps it up for me as well, Dana. All right. Sounds good. Well, thank you very much, Steve, for being a Patreon supporter and for sending us your deck to take a look at. If you want to support us and get us to do a deck tech like this, you can go to patreon.com, CMDR Central, and see how you could support us and how we could also do a, a special deck tech for you that comes out on Thursdays. Until next week's regular Monday show, I am Dana. And I'm Max. And I'm not Chris because I'm not here. <laughs> see you guys next week. Yeah.